Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during this presentation, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of presentations. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to welcome everybody to the October 13th uh, edition of Crop Talk. And, uh, as we're uh, winding down harvest, uh, I think in a lot of areas there's just some of the late fall crops left like uh, uh, sunflowers and corn, but the majority of the areas have picked up most of the crop already and uh, a lot of the people, or a lot of producers are looking to uh, looking into fall work. Uh, we had a real good week last week with uh, the uh, soils and uh, uh, the soils meetings that were held, uh, real good attendance, and uh, I thought maybe it would be a good idea to follow up that. There was a lot of talk about soil sampling and finding out what we um, <clears throat> what we have in the soil before next year as we look at fertilizer prices, and uh, and a lot of producers wondering, uh, you know, how much they're going to need to buy. I uh, I thought it would be a good uh, time if. Uh, to get John on to maybe talk a little bit about uh, understanding our uh, soil sample results uh, as we uh, start getting those uh, those uh, tests back in. And then I uh, also thought it'd be, uh, it's a good time right now to look at uh, the top cereal crops for 2021 as we uh, received information from uh, MASC of the, uh, of the uh, um, I guess the, the crop, uh, the varieties that were most planted in, in Manitoba here uh, on the cereal crops. And uh, we have an opportunity to get Anne to talk about that as well this morning. So um, I think to start with, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to jump to uh, the uh, look into the top cereal crops uh, for 2021 and uh, get Anne to start off here and look at, at, uh, at some of the varieties. Okay, thanks, Lionel. Um, okay, I think my screen is uh, shared now. So, uh, yeah, I'll just start off by this is just a summary of the um, mask seeded acreage report that came out last week. So, I did just summarize um, uh, you can see the top crops uh, canola, wheat, and soybeans. For wheat, I just combined all wheat types, including winter. Um, so yeah, you can see, uh, you know, the position of the top crops doesn't change very much every year. Uh, just in terms of cereals, we did see a slight decrease um, in acreage from cereals from last year to this year. So it was about uh, 2,900,000 last year. Uh, oats also saw a slight decrease, I think just about 20,000 acres less reported for oats. Uh, but we did see an increase of with barley, I think about 20,000 acres as well. So um, not too much change with the cereal crops in terms of uh, acreage. And in terms of winter wheat, I don't have it on this slide here, but we did see a slight increase in winter wheat acreage um, from 2020 to 2021, but acreage remains quite low. Um, I think it was about 34,000 acres for uh, 2021, and I think about 29,000 reported in 2020. Uh, so, you know, not big changes there. So. Just looking into a bit more of, um, of the actual crop types that we do see grown in Manitoba. So this is from the Statistics Canada um, report, seeded acreage report. So I just put the top three crops in here just to see how things have changed in the last 20 years. So we do see an increase in canola acres um, in at each of those five year periods in the last 20 years. You know, a big increase in soybean acres, which we've all noticed in the province. And then wheat has, um, you know, dipped down a bit, but on the whole remained relatively stable. So when we look at this graph, you can infer that, you know, wheat acres aren't changing. They're changing, but they're not changing a whole lot. Um, but canola is increasing and soybeans are increasing. So that does indicate that, you know, we're seeing less of the less flax, less um, sunflowers. Um, less barley, less oats, those sorts of things have been decreasing in acreage to have uh, these shorter rotations. So just 
trying to change my slide here just a moment. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is um, looking at all of the crops, the main crops reported for um, from Statistics Canada, but just breaking up the smaller acreage crops uh, just so that we can see them better. Um, yeah, we do see a decrease in winter wheat. Uh, oats, barley, rye has actually increased, I think just because of the um, popularity of the hybrid rye. We see an increase in grain corn, a uh, decrease in flax, sunflowers, and then peas have been increasing again. And we'll probably um, you know, see higher pea acreages as well. So just, although not 2021 data, it is just interesting to see uh, when we're talking about crop yields and varieties, uh, yeah, just to get an idea of what we're seeing out there in the province. So uh, just breaking out spring wheat acreage in general, we are seeing that the vast majority of the wheat acres being planted are um, Canadian Western Red Spring Wheat. Um, then after that, we're seeing the Canadian Northern Hard Reds, a smaller portion of the Canadian Prairie Springs, about 42,000 acres, uh, really decreasing acreage in Canadian Western Hard White Spring Wheat. And um, you know, Durham wheat, I think, has stayed pretty steady over the last couple of years at about 1,500 acres. So when we're looking at our top our spring wheat varieties, this these graphs have stayed, the top varieties have stayed very stable over the past uh, quite a few years. So I can't remember exactly the year that Brandon was introduced, but Brandon has had um, by far the top share of spring wheat varieties being planted um, over the last number of years. Uh, although we are seeing uh, this year, we did see a big increase in Starbuck wheat. So another new variety that, um, that has obviously been gaining in popularity. So just, um, yeah, it's just interesting to see how long Brandon has remained extremely popular for um, across the prairies. And then the other top, um, top type of wheat that we see being produced is the Canadian Northern Hard Red Wheats. And this also, the variety market share hasn't changed a lot since this uh, market class was introduced. We do see Faller and Prosper making up, um, they're not quite 80 and not quite 20%. There's a very small amount of, the only other thing reported in the mask report is uh, no variety. So um, no farmers weren't reporting any other of the named uh, varieties, at least on more than 500 acres. So we do see for the Canadian Northern Hard Reds, the Faller and Prosper are by far the most popular. Uh, <laughs> move my slide again, but um, oh, there we go. So I just wanted to pull up, uh, this is from the Seed Manitoba from last year. Just looking, I, just looking at the Canadian Northern Hard Red um, uh, listing. So the second column here, I don't have the column names written here by accident, but the second column here is uh, is yield. So we do see that Faller and Prosper, um, you know, are are the highest yielding. Um, Elgin ND is also a quite high yielding variety. And um, so this, you know, may increase in popularity as well. So about the same yield as, um, um, yeah, a little bit lower yield than Faller and Prosper. But I think it's just the popularity of these just has to do with their high yields because uh, that's why people are growing that Canadian Northern Hard Red class of wheat. And um, except, so I should just also point out that Elgin ND, Faller and Prosper, those are all varieties, um, you know, that were put into the Nor Northern Hard Red class um, at the time when it was created. And a lot of these other varieties like uh, Harvest, Cane, Unity, those are varieties that were moved from the Canadian Western Red Spring Wheat class into the Canadian Northern Hard Red class. Uh, mostly due to their um, uh, their milling and baking characteristics. So the gluten strength for those was falling below uh, what was deemed acceptable for Canadian Western Red Spring Wheat, which is why this new market class was formed and those varieties were moved in there. So those weren't necessarily moved into the Northern Hard Red because they're high yielding, but just because their quality characteristics uh, fit more in this wheat class. Uh, so for oat varieties, we have seen also Summit and Camden are um, have the, the biggest percent of the market share. And those varieties also have remained quite popular over the last number of years, um, both as good uh, milling oat varieties. 
I added a sixth variety at the bottom here. Uh, so the top five varieties are all, um, oops, are all milling oats. Uh, the bottom variety here with 2% of the market share is CDC Haymaker is a forage variety. So uh, there's probably more forage varieties being grown, but probably uh, insured at a lower percentage. Uh, and then moving on to barley varieties, um, I did indicate here the top two varieties, uh, Austinson has remained one of the top varieties over the last number of years um, as a food and feed variety. Uh, Conlon would be uh, second in terms of market share. And then the other three varieties here with M behind them, those are malting varieties. So um, I just indicated this because it's you know good to keep in mind uh, what percent of the varieties being grown are for food and feed and which ones uh, farmers are probably targeting targeting malting. So um, Austinson uh, yeah, has been in the top variety grown in the province for the last number of years as well. Uh, and then for full rye, I just wanted to break this down by hybrid and open pollinated because uh, due to increasing rye acreage, MASC is actually able to report um, on hybrid varieties just in the past few years. Uh, in terms of their market share and what's being grown. So the uh, pie chart on the right-hand side just shows the percent of uh, hybrid versus open pollinated acres. So we are seeing more hybrid acres, but um, not, you know, I thought that there'd be, I thought that the proportions would be uh, more skewed towards hybrid acres than open pollinated, but it's about 50-50. And this year we did see about 100,000 acres of rye being grown in the province, which um, has been increasing in recent years. So for hybrids, um, the KWS varieties are by far the most popular. Um, a lot of these are newer varieties that have recently been registered in Canada, uh, mostly European varieties. Uh, and these varieties, you know, do produce um, do produce quite a bit of higher yields than the open pollinated varieties. And then for open pollinated, definitely the most popular is Hazlitt and has been for quite a number of years. It's an older variety that does uh, perform quite well, which is why it's um, stayed quite popular. And then uh, I'll just cover winter wheat as the last crop here. So I did mention before it had about 35,000 acres reported this year. Uh, we did have, I think we had a low amount of winter wheat planted last year. Uh, the soil conditions were very dry in the fall and it wasn't the conditions weren't great for planting uh, winter wheat so i do think that there were less acres planted last year than maybe would have been in a better um, environmental under better environmental conditions um, so emerson has uh, been one of the top varieties uh, for quite a number of years uh, but we do see this year that gateway has you know approximately similar market share to emerson uh, in terms of winter wheat acres this year, I don't want to estimate how many acres have been planted, but I do think um, just talking to winter wheat seed growers, uh, I think that we probably saw quite a few winter wheat acres being planted this year. I assume probably a bit more than last year um, that, yeah, a lot of people did sell out of winter wheat this year. So we could have probably seen more winter wheat planted than, than was planted, but there just wasn't the seed supply to meet the demand for winter wheat this year. Um, and I think almost every winter wheat grower that I did talk to had sold out of winter wheat and they were looking for winter wheat in other provinces. So just um, this is from this is from the um, Statistics Canada report, but just looking at years on the bottom and acres on the right, uh, we do see uh, the rise and fall of popularity of winter wheat over the last 20 years, or over the last 21 years. Uh, with winter wheat acreage remaining, um, you know, fairly low over the past five years. So, you know, with the advent of perhaps some new varieties and uh, good environmental conditions in the fall, we could see, uh, maybe see higher winter wheat acres in the future. Uh, so that's all I have uh, for cereal varieties and just a general overview of the mask seeded acreage report for this morning. If anyone I guess uh, we could probably do questions at the end or whatever uh, Lionel prefers. Hey, thanks, Anne. I will uh, maybe uh, go through a few questions that we, we got in here. Um, one question, I guess, back to the wheat varieties. And uh, do you think VB varieties will start to be more popular in the coming years? 
Yeah, definitely. I am, we do see, you know, Midge is something that has been more on people's radar in the past few years. So uh, quite a few of the new varieties um, are VB. And I do think, so Starbuck, so Brandon, for example, isn't, um, isn't a Midge tolerant variety, but Starbuck is. Um, and Viewfield, uh, I believe Viewfield also is. Oh no, Viewfield is not, um, but Wheatland is. So I think we are seeing a higher percentage of the VB, VB varieties being grown um, and just people not wanting to take chances and preferring to grow that, um, you know, in case we do have a mid-year. Okay, and uh, another question. Um, looking at buying uh, my seed wheat uh, for next year, um, what, with high prices, what would be your recommendation for seeding rates in wheat and barley? Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd probably target um, like a higher seeding. Like if I was, I'd probably recommend, you know, a higher seeding rate for both wheat and barley. So we do recommend, I think it's about uh, 24 to 30 or 25 to 30 plants per square foot um, in terms of for barley, I believe we're looking at uh, 24 to 28, and spring wheat is about the same in terms of our recommended. For spring wheat, I, you know, you could go up to 30, 32 plants per square foot. Um, if we have a year with good environmental conditions, you know, we'd probably see spring wheat uh, yields being relatively stable across a range of uh, seeding rates. So, you know, under good environmental conditions, wheat has a good ability all cereals have a good ability to tiller and make up for, um, for perhaps lower plant stands. But in terms of, um, you know, I would probably just target a bit of a higher seeding rate to make sure you have a good plant stand for a good uniform crop. Uh, barley is a bit trickier just with, um, it depends if you're targeting malting or food and feed varieties. So food and feed, I'd recommend going with, you know, on the higher end of that seeding rate. Um, and yeah, probably the same as with malting. Uh, you just be a bit more cautious in terms of you don't want your seed to be um, too small. Uh, so just you know being a bit more concerned about you know your seeding rate to target um, uh, a certain size of seed and good uniformity in your malting barley. Okay, and um, one more. Um, looking at uh, Pini or using my own seed. Um, how low or what would you consider to be too low for uh, germination? Um, yeah, I guess that, that's a good question. Obviously with lower germination, you're putting more seed in the ground. Uh, so, you know, like if, if your germination's in the 80s, you would just adjust your seeding rate to ensure that, um, that you'd still be getting the right number of seeds in the ground. I guess one of the, one consideration would be um, thinking about your germination and ha how many seeds you can properly put through your seeder and get a good, um, you know, good even distribution of seed in the soil and not have too much clumping. So I would say it probably depends on your seeder and how evenly you think you can seed it. And also, you know, if your germination was in the 50s, I would probably just recommend, I would just recommend buying seed because it would be tricky to put in say double the amount of seed that you wanted to um that, that you wanted to end up with so but yeah definitely recommend um doing germination tests prior to planting your own seed because you know depending on the year and the environmental conditions at harvest you could be surprised at the germination rate okay and uh i agree with you i've uh, seen a lot of a lot more winter wheat go in this fall than i've seen in the last uh probably 10 years almost in the in the southwest here so uh winter wheat acres i think uh are are going to be up but uh, i think you're right with uh we were limited with the amount of seed we had and uh it's going to be interesting next year to see what crops get chosen because there's some pretty interesting prices out for oats and uh and wheat and barley so it'll be uh, interesting to see what our numbers land up next year yeah, yeah, it'll definitely be interesting. And I'm, I was wondering with winter wheat if people, like we had such challenging conditions, especially, you know, late June, July, 
in terms of being excessively dry and really hot. So I was wondering if also people are thinking, you know, if they plant winter wheat now, um, soil moisture conditions were okay when it was winter wheat planting time. So I think people got pretty good emergence and germination. And that winter wheat will be able to access and take advantage of any early spring moisture and probably get a good start. So I was wondering if it was, you know, partially wheat prices and then also partially just um, people wanting to ensure that their crop got off to a good start uh, just because of the challenging spring and summer conditions we've had last year. And obviously it's not a bad idea to have your crop flowering um, before it's excessively hot. So if that winter wheat can be flowering, um, you know, a little bit before we have really high temperatures, then that's also definitely a bonus for winter wheat as well. You bet spreading out the risk is, is what guys are, we're looking at this fall, I think. So good. Um, thanks, Anne. That was uh, some good information for what we've seen for uh, some of the cereal crops this past year. And I think uh, a little bit of a look into what might be happening for next year. So uh, thanks again, Anne. Oh, thanks. Okay. Uh, I see John is on, so maybe, uh, Laurie, let's uh, pass the screen over to John, and John will give us a, a little bit of an update on maybe looking at our soil test results and how to better interpret them for our, uh, for our fields. Okay, uh, thank you here. Uh, just let me try to get my screen up there. Uh, says it's paused, or is it showing? I can see your screen, just go to um, slide show. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you've got the uh, first bit. Uh, I want to thank Anne for running through that and say that uh, one of the things we are kind of excited about some of the new winter wheat varieties. And uh, this year, uh, we're working uh, closely with Ducks Unlimited and some others to kind of revamp the nitrogen rates. Uh, one, one of the problems is the, the breeders keep bringing along some of these new varieties and things, but what doesn't keep pace is the agronomic production package to suit the new types. And so we're kind of excited about, uh, I think at all our diversification sites this year, we've got winter wheat going in the ground with a bunch of nitrogen management strategies that we're wanting to get on top of. So uh, we're hoping putting the agronomic package together, uh, again, uh, increases the, the attractiveness or the success with these new types. So, Excuse uh, me, John, I'm just going to interrupt you for one moment. We can just see your working copy. Can, is there a way you can put it to slideshow or is it tricking you thinking it is? Oh. Well, let me click on slideshow again. How's that? Nope. Oh, okay. Well, let me end my show and I'll double click. Unless we just can carry, we can carry on like this. We can see your information if that's uh, if that's okay. okay with you. Oh, I I I give I gave up on perfection long ago, Lori. <laughs> okay, well let's carry on as long as your slides move forward. The information is okay. all there. Okay, good. So uh, what I'm I'm going to do here is. Uh, Oh, I don't want to leave the webinar. Okay, uh, just go over uh, some of what uh, Lino asked about soil test interpretation, but I'm really just going to focus on uh, what do we really need to be paying attention for this year? What's nor what's out of the normal? Do we need to be paying closer attention to? So when we get to that, watch for the red ink. That's what's kind of new this year. And so, uh, of course, you know, the mom and apple pie statement, of course, you should soil test, just like, of course, you should brush your teeth every time you, uh, twice a day. But the other reason why you should soil test that's going to be a big impetus is because fertilizer is expensive. Uh, uh, recent prices I have here based on uh, ammonia at close to 70 cents per pound of N or urea at 90 cents. Sorry, John, I'm going to interrupt you one more time. I can only see your first slide. Have you moved to the second slide? I can see it. I uh, can't. We, uh, is, uh, Lionel, are you, is it moving for you or is this just maybe a me thing? There we go. I can see. There we are. We're working now. Carry on. Um, maybe it's just slow. Maybe I just need to talk. 
lot slower so it can keep it seems uh, to be working now john so you go right ahead okay. sorry about that uh no problem so fertilizers are exp uh more expensive and the other thing is we're seeing potential for high carryover particularly of nitrogen uh, but maybe we'll look at some of the other nutrients if we have low drought affected yields chances are we're going to have uh, greater reserves of nutrients left so those are kind of what's maybe going to be different uh, I, I've, I've switched slides to show a bunch of different soil tests that possibly could be done in manitoba uh, three of these i can make comment on because they use kind of traditional chemistry uh, uh, the uh, western ag lab uses a, a different approach and so they've got different interpretations with that. But I'll make mention more in regards to the traditional chemistry. Uh, the three main labs operating for Manitoba customers would be ANL, which does their testing in London, Ontario. AgBuys does their testing uh, just south in uh, North Dakota. And Farmer's Edge does testing in Winnipeg. So going to look at you know the analyses and and uh we're, what's going to show up on those analyses that are uh current and should be keeping an eye out for this year uh, not going to mention anything about recommendations that's that's another conversation for you to have with your agronomist a lot of other factors involved in that but as far as the analysis we'll look at some of the key points there so um, the analysis information always assumes a proper job of sampling the field. Again, there's the three components of the test, uh, the properties or what I call the yield potential, then nutrients, and then the recommendations. And the soil properties that are on your soil test, many of those do not change or change very slowly. So sometimes you only need them done periodically. Uh, sometimes once a lifetime, like cation exchange capacity, which is really a bit of a proxy for what's the soil texture in your field. And, and unless you're going to uh, uh, live a very long time, that's not going to change very much. You're never going to change the texture and organic matter, the other component is going to change very slowly. So organic matter changes slowly. pH generally changes slowly, although uh, uh, we're seeing it dropping in some of our really sandy soils. Salts are a soil property, and they're dependent on what is the moisture regime, so they can change year to year. Again, cation exchange capacity, why I might care this year is that it is uh, uh, something that just consists of the clay content, uh, clay content and the organic matter in the soil. And the key thing is it relates to the water holding capacity. Uh, so knowing what your cation exchange capacity is gives you a measure of how much water or yield potential are you going to hold in your soil. Now, of course, it's also uh, important uh, for holding on to positively charged nutrients, cations like potassium and calcium. But for this next year, I think we're going to worry a whole lot more about water. And they, the labs all provide, uh, uh, you know, a cutting exchange capacity. Generally, it's an estimate, and that estimate is made by just adding up all the bases, the base nutrients. So it adds up the potassium, calcium, magnesium, sodium, uh, in, in the soil that's measured, and then it tallies those to give a cation exchange capacity. Uh, that works fairly well as long as our soil pH is less than about 7.2 or 7.4. If it's our pH is above that and there's free lime in the soil, then this method does not work that well. Base saturation. Base saturation itself is really important in our soils. It's what makes them so productive. It's when our exchange sites are not occupied by bases. When they're occupied by hydrogen, that means our soils are acidic, 
and they need intervention with lime. But as long as we've got a high saturation with bases, our soils are rather productive. And so here's, if your cat exchange capacity comes back and falls into those values on the right side, then it kind of equates to the soil textures we see. And so sandy soils tend to have P, uh, cat exchange capacities, very poor sands below 10, sandy loams will be 10 to 20. Uh, silt loams or clay loam soils, we generally see in the 20 to 30. And then our heavy clay soils will be, um, generally I see 30 up to 50 in parts of the Red River Valley. So this gives a measure of the exchange of the soil texture. And soil texture relates directly to how much water I can store in the soil. Probably all seen such a graph with the field capacity, the wilting point, and the difference between that in the soil is how many inches of water it will store for crop use per foot of depth. And something we're going to be pretty conversant in this year, people are wondering, where, where do we come up with this number that we, we need uh, 10 inches of water to have a fully charged soil? Well, in a four foot rooting depth on a, uh, a loam or clay loam or clay soil, uh, multiply these numbers by four and we're at about 10 inches. That's the type of recharged soils we'd like to see for high yield potential. Uh, the other thing on here is salts and uh, all the labs will, will generally measure the salts in the soil. It's important for general productivity, but salts, they are kind of dependent on where the water is moving. So if, uh, uh, but they can restrict your crop rotations. I think the, the next slide here shows that uh, of the, the crops most sensitive that we grow are probably going to be corn and soybeans or edible beans, and they tolerate very low EC or salt levels before yields start to tail off, where cereals, uh, we'd expect canola and others, can tolerate more salty conditions. They can't tolerate all salt, but they are certainly more tolerant than things like corn and soybeans. So, we look at this to help us in crop selection. Changes in salinity. Well, if it follows that salts follow the water, uh, and if we've had a year with lack of rainfall and a lowering water table, you may look at this and say, well, maybe my salt levels may actually be a little bit less. But because they move with water, if my water table tended to be high, and if there was any fallowing done, evaporation to the surface, that's where those salts would have moved. So uh, you really need to test to know if you're in a situation where you've been accumulating or not. With this bit of rain that we've had this fall, it's a good chance that salts at the surface have been washed slightly deeper, not washed away. They'll come back when we get water evaporating to the surface again. Nitrate which is uh, one of the nutrients that uh, we're seeing uh, very high levels this year, and I'll we'll get to that. But I wanted to put this thumb rule out that uh, Don Flayton, kind of uh, one of his holy grails, he was looking to put out there, and they were able to develop it with corn and wheat in recent years, that if you look at your soil test, and this is a pretty loose rule, because there's a lot of factors, but if it's testing, you know, this is your two foot depth, less than 20 pounds, then it may be that you had insufficient nitrogen supplied for the yield potential that was there. If you're between 20 and 50, well then not a bad job of meeting the supply. Uh, that's a reasonable carryover amount. More than 50 or with wheat more than 60, it means more nitrogen was supplied than the yield potential that was available. So in a year like this with uh, drought, perhaps, putting a lid on yields, probably more nitrogen was supplied than what was used. So that those are some benchmark values to consider when you're looking at your soil test. Uh, what caused variability this year? Why would it be different than normal? I've just highlighted there. It's generally low crop yields in, in, in essence here. 
drought is probably the main thing that is uh, leading to high levels. But again, you can see by the list here, there we've got lots. We can explain this no matter which way the nitrate levels go. We've got an excuse for every situation. But this year, we're looking at uh, drought as being a, the main driver. Uh, AgVise Lab produces some summaries, and here's some of their more recent. And if we were to look uh, at what would be a typical or longer term average of uh, carryover nitrogen, it'd be somewhere between that 20 to 40 pound per acre range. And yet we could see this year, uh, particularly in maybe, I, I guess I'd say the eastern parts of Manitoba, that we have over 30 in the interlake, up to 40% of the samples testing over 100 pounds of nitrogen. And so those are, uh, those are extreme. And we would say where we're getting those levels, that's generally going to be due to low yields produced because of, of uh, uh, probably drought conditions. And so we have uh, levels of, of carryover nitrogen that are sometimes 50, 60 pounds nitrogen more than what tradition is. Interesting, Lionel, when I look here at how they grouped Brandon and Western Manitoba, uh, I think bank, you've got some areas out there with some rains, some better yield potential, and maybe you, you'll be seeing maybe slightly higher residual nitrogen. But and again, we produce good yields. I'd expect that nitrate levels probably fall in line with some of your long-term values. So it's, you still need a test to know. You can't, uh, uh, this gives us a snapshot, but it doesn't give you uh, uh, an individual's results. When I look at nitrate on the soil test, it's, it, it'll be there if you've asked for it uh, at either of these labs. And uh, uh, generally it's in uh, pounds per acre so that we can uh, simply uh, subtract the, uh, th that from the total amount needed to come up with a recommendation. Uh, sulfur, I put it in here because it's the other mobile nutrient that we measure in the top two feet. Uh, it's highly variable in the landscape. Uh, we, we, we have uh, limited faith in the soil test because it does measure what's there, but what's there can vary quite a bit depending on the landscape. Uh, and so uh, we do know that it's a critical nutrient for canola and forages. Uh, often with canola, farmers will uh, They'll look at the sulfur number, but would they'll generally pencil in a sulfur application anyways for those high need crops. Uh, sulfur is reported by each of the soil test companies here. Um, and is there variability in sulfate sulfur? Well, this past year, uh, I, will, I would not have expected much in the way of movement of sulfur uh, because we didn't get a lot of in-season rainfall. Uh, and in fact, sulfur levels are probably going to, they'll be affected by the same things that affect salinity in the soil. Uh, so uh, again, it's gonna come standard in your soil test. I expect as in the past, people will put sulfur on the crops that need it the most and generally coast with some of the others. Phosphorus, uh, very important standard in the soil test. Uh, again, uh, the test that is most appropriate for our soils that tend to be neutral to high pH is the Olson test. Other tests are done, uh, but generally less relevant to us and not, not calibrated with uh, recommendations. Things that may have impacted the soil test this year, uh, put in red, there have been generally lower removals if there's lower yields. Something that may be a factor is if we're inadvertently sampling fertilizer bands. I think most agronomists are trained to do this, that uh, try not to poke in that starter fertilizer band. In the bottom, I put down here, this is why I, I do not expect much change in soil test phosphorus, even though yields may have been reduced. Uh, that it takes quite a bit of phosphorus addition or removal to change the soil test value. Manitoba studies, it takes anywhere between 16 to 40 pounds of phosphate fertilizer per acre to change the soil test uh, 
by one part per million. So that those are typical annual applications. If no crop was removed and those votes rates were applied, the most you'd expect your soil test to change would be one or two parts per million. So don't expect big changes in phosphorus. Uh, and again, here, when you look at the, the soil test report, again, it's important to see that which method is it that they're measuring it with. Um, I put this in here. This is kind of a, our newer concept of looking at phosphorus uh, over the long term about moving phosphorus levels into a, an optimum maintenance range. But what I put in here in red is what are we going to do this year with high fertilizer prices? And so the first note is, if you're testing less than 10 parts per million, well, then your soils are low or very low, and you don't have a lot of wiggle room. You will probably still need to be applying those annual rates of phosphorus, according to soil test. Uh, uh, if you're looking for a more conservative approach, use the sufficiency rates that uh, we have in our fertilizer guide. Uh, Again, some of those rates may be below removal. So it means in the future, you have to step up your application rates. If you've been able to build your soil test levels into what we call a good maintenance or good working range, 10 to 20 parts per million, uh, then there's a bit more flexibility. You may well be able to get away in the short term with uh, a starter rates of 15 to 20 pounds of phosphorus per acre, depending on the yields you're looking for. So if you're finding phosphorus just way too expensive, now you start to see some of the reward for building your soils into a, a working range where you have a little more flexibility. But again, those are conversations you need to have with your agronomist. And if your levels are above 20 parts per million, then you've got the real luxury of uh, taking a bit of a, a phosphorus holiday or a break perhaps and saying that starter rates on those soils are probably going to uh, still give full yield potential knowing full well that if you have good crops you're going to be removing more than you've applied and depleting those and again wanting to pencil in the future rebuilding with potassium uh this past year uh, we probably would have expected to see some greater crop yield response to potassium because under cool, dry conditions, uh, there are reduced diffusion rates or movement to the, uh, uh, to, to the, to the roots. Uh, and it tends to be in years when we have dry conditions in the spring that we tend to see those yield responses to low rates, 10, 15 pounds of potassium uh, uh, seed placed or side banded with cereals, even on high testing soils. It, it, and that potassium response is not due to soil test levels, but due to the environmental conditions and how potassium moves slowly in the soil. Uh, potassium is measured in the exchangeable form. We measure the potassium that is kind of stuck on the outside of the clay and organic matter particles. That's the reserve that's available for supplying over the course of the growing season and a, a pretty reliable number. Uh, when it comes to what are good target levels to have, I put up a slide here based on a, on a number of studies, but I've highlighted that the potassium category uh, that we would like to have our soil test levels in would be over 100 parts per million for most of our crops, uh, cereals, oil seeds, we'd like to have at, at those levels uh, or above. And so some people on our more depleted or sandier soils may need to build to that. Uh, our critical levels for potatoes and corn are double that, are 200 parts per million. So uh, there, uh, uh, for those crops, we, we do look to have a higher level in the soil before we would dare uh, dropping potassium from the fertilizer program. So, so there's some target values. 
variability this past year, I said there's a couple of things may have changed the soil test level. On the decreasing soil test would be high removals. If we removed cereal crops as green feed or forage, if you're removing corn silage, and if we're removing straw, those are all depletions of, of reserves and uh, may need to be taken into account, particularly on lighter textured soils, sandier or uh, loamier soils that don't have the same reserves as our clay soils. What may have increased soil test potassium uh, if we had low removals and or, or no crop removal and so there may there be a, a very slight increase. Some, something to note in your soil test is that under very dry conditions, such as we had up until some rewetting, is that potassium that's generally held on the surfaces of clay uh, on that exchange complex can actually be trapped between clay sheets or that terminology is fixed. And as it dries, that fixation is tighter. Uh, so that could lead to a bit less availability, a bit less showing up in the soil test. But as soils re-wet, they generally those levels and availability quickly return to a normal level. But that's just some of the, the reactions that take place in the soils with potassium under very dry conditions. Don't have much to say about micronutrients, Lionel, other than some labs. Uh, uh, use different extractants. Uh, uh, ANL tends to use some different extractants than are than are what traditional on the prairies, and so you really need to drill down and use guidelines uh, specific to to each of the laboratories you're using. If you're looking for a second opinion uh, on online, you can get some of our fertilizer tables out, out of the soil fertility guide. Uh, they tend to be conservative. Uh, we tend to have printed in there the sufficiency or short term uh, rates for phosphorus. So if you're looking to be uh, frugal this year with your phosphorus dollar, you may well wish to consider these guidelines, knowing full well that with the yields that we're currently producing, these rates generally uh, will lead to soil depletion. And it's a short-term sufficiency approach. Lionel, uh, you asked about fall fertilization pointers, and here's a few that until recently, we still had August weather, hot days and warm soils, and the caution in nitrogen applications under those conditions, even as a hydrous ammonia, we expect that under those higher temperatures that the conversion to nitrate takes place rather quickly, and then it leaves it in the nitrate form that could be lost if it turns wet. So our, my, my, my recommendation, and I hopefully a lot of agronomists uh, with uh, plying their trade out there have been cautioning growers, use a proven nitrification inhibitor, one with uh, the, the active chemistry that we know that acts as a nitrification inhibitor. So that would be in, for example, in Cinchero for ammonia, or Enserve uh, with ammonia, or in Trench with uh, urea, or Super U contains DCD. Uh, those are the proven nitrification inhibitors and the ones that uh, we'd have confidence that they are going to keep your ammonia or urea in the ammonium form longer and, and safer. The other driver on this is soil temperatures. If I just wait till the soils cool down, that will slow the conversion to nitrate. And if we look back, I clipped these today, but up until the weekend when it turned cool, those temperatures had not changed for about two weeks. It, uh, the daytime averages were still in about uh, 14 to 15 uh, degrees C, meaning conversion to nitrate would happen quickly. Uh, but after Thanksgiving, uh, we've had cool conditions. The soils are dropping into the 10 degree range, which is a reasonable target by when you would consider starting uh, putting on ammonia. Uh, one other thing before I leave the inhibitors, I got to do my, uh, I got to talk for the planet here. And 
when it comes to global warming, uh, the nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizers, Dr. Mario Tenuta has shown tremendous success by using those nitrification inhibitors shown earlier, can reduce uh, nitrous oxide by 50, 30 to 50%. And that is above and beyond the agronomic benefits. So as we move to saving the planet here, I'm thinking those nitrification inhibitors are going to become even more critical for farm use in uh, not just for agronomic performance. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, you may just need to pay a bit more in order to save the planet, but, but those are some uh, real actions that you can take today that to curb nitrous oxide. Okay, the, adver the advertorial is done. How cold temperatures work, we've got this classic re research by uh, uh, Kevin Thiessen and Don Flayton showing that if we apply a more, uh, in this case, urea earlier in the fall, we sometimes uh, on particularly wetter soils or, or wetter parts of the landscape, we don't get as, as good yields uh, uh, unless we wait until soils have cooled down. On drier parts of the landscape where we don't get this excess water, uh, there we're able to tolerate it better uh, even with earlier applications. Just showing here that it's it's wetness that drives these losses and why it's important to uh, delay uh, uh, application if possible. And something else, the, the last couple of years has been a, a, a tough thing. It's been awfully dry. After this rain, I'm, I'm thinking uh, as things dry off, it will be full speed ahead. In the past, when it's been very dry and we've worked up clods when we're applying ammonia, it can be tough to get a good seal on that. And our options for that is either to apply the ammonia deeper, do some pre-tillage of the soil, or wait for moisture to improve the tilth. Your wish has been granted. Moisture has arrived. So I'm hoping that as uh, we get back in those fields that uh, uh, our ammonia uh, will um, be able to go in and, and, and be sealed up adequately. That's all I have for now, Lionel. Uh, if there's any questions, you can start taking them from the audience. Okay, uh, I'll start with one here right now. Uh, what is your opinion on fall broadcast Super U? Are we, are we losing much and over winter? Um, I, I'm putting a Band-Aid on a bad application system. So broadcasting, uh, the, there's one particular loss I did not talk about here. And the loss that is encouraged by broadcasting is called immobilization. It's not a permanent loss. It's when the, the, the nitrogen is tied up by the bugs to break down the straw and that uh, can uh, reduce early season nitrogen availability. That's the, 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 the main issue when we broadcast fertilizer and mix it in. It's, it, it's inefficient in regards to uh, uh, immobilization. But uh, the thing that the Super U does, well, if you just broadcast straight urea, that conversion to nitrate uh, tends to proceed quicker. If it has Super U, it's the DCD component in there, inhibits the bacteria that do that conversion. So yes, it should hold that nitrogen in the uh, ammonium form longer, which is a good thing if it turns wet, uh, but it really won't do much uh, to combat immobilization. Okay. Uh, what do you recommend for soybeans next year on these high-end soils? Avoid <laughs> in high residual, less than 60 pounds of N. Yeah, yeah. People have a great memory. You know, Lionel, sometimes you and I wonder if farmers ever remember something we say. And, you know, that, that thumb rule from 15 years ago, we kind of pulled out of a hat. We did have some failures with on virgin soybean fields where uh, uh, people didn't get good inoculation and one of the culprits was high nitrate. So based on some field observations, 
very, very few research studies because no one does research on these things. That's where we kind of developed that thumb rule of 60 to 70 pounds of nitrate in that really uh, nodulation the uh, uh, is impacted, is reduced, and so try to avoid those fields. That was for first year soybeans. So fast forward to 2022, uh, and uh, many fields will have had soybeans, successful soybean crops three or four times. We have a, uh, a resident population of rhizobium in many of them. And so, uh, oh gosh, I think 2013, we did about 13 little field gorilla studies where we broadcast fertilizer and uh, in the spring and caused high nitrate levels. And we found that, uh, yes, with the high nitrate levels on the virgin fields, it reduced nodules below 10 per plant. So reduced it below what we would have liked in, in four or five cases. Where we had fields with a history of soybeans, uh, nodule, uh, nodulation was still reduced but it, it was already at a far higher level because it was benefiting from that uh, uh, resident population. And in only four of eight cases was it reduced below 10 per plant. And there was uh, basically, it looked like there was no impact on the, the final yield, protein maybe a little less. So it looks like once we've grown a population of soybeans uh, and have a resident population, it's less critical I can't say it isn't critical because it does reduce the amount of nodules. Uh, so, but Lionel, even before we get to that conversation, go to the fertilizer dealer and price your nitrogen. And I think you'll find out that high level, high rates of nitrogen are far more valuable to use on canola, wheat, and corn than to squander on soybeans. So this conversation really is only for those that are struggling to find a, uh, uh, a home for their soybean crop. Uh, I'm hoping they exploit that nitrogen with the other crops. Uh, but yes, those nitrate levels, critical for virgin or first time soybean fields, not so much for experienced fields. And no, I don't know the new number. I hear some agronomists talking about 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. But again, I, I'm sure that, that that's, uh, that's just a, uh, uh, a thumb rule that they're presumably developing from field observations, which is all we have okay. to go by. Okay, and I got two questions that came in saying, asking, would you assume the same rule of thumb for legumes like peas or lentils? Um, well, I, I, I am no pea or lentil agronomist. Uh, but in conversations with a few of the agronomists out there, uh, seems that Guy Lafon did do some research on peas and found that once nitrate levels got above 50 pounds per acre, that he was seeing inhibition. So there was a bit of a thumb rule developed maybe with that. Uh, but uh, again, people are going to have to look for a, a, home, uh, a home for that. I uh, your people are just going to have to talk to some uh, uh, agronomists on that. I, I can't pull any research out of thin air here uh, as guidance for those. Uh, my guidance would be is that choose some of your lower fields. Um, uh, well, well, going back to the previous one, uh, if people are looking for the lowest nitrogen levels in their soils, it's probably going to be following soybeans they always tend to remove most and because we don't put nitrogen on soybeans there's probably not a high level there for carryover but that comes with a whole bunch of new baggage in regards to rotational concerns about disease weeds and herbicide resistance and so that's got to be carefully balanced you know how badly do you want to grow soybeans that you would actually grow soys on soys uh, and I think there's restrictions as to why you would put peas after soybeans because you don't want to deal with the volunteers. So um, I don't have an answer for you there other than choose choose your lowest fields to put peas on. 
and make sure you've done some good nodulation. Uh, granular inoculant may, uh, may provide some uh, uh, better longevity or a longer supply of rhizobium in the soil for when it's needed later. Okay, um, what is your estimate of how much residual land has been mineralized or leached since oh, the recent there, there's rainfall? There's a sec, someone's calling to, that disagrees with my opinion. Okay. 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 Sorry, yeah. about that. Sorry for interrupting you there. Oh, no. Uh, another question, what is your estimate on how much residual land has been mineralized or leached since the recent rainfall in the soils with 100 pounds of N in the top six to 12 inches? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think uh, uh, a lot, but the, the rainfall uh, will tend to move some. Uh, we sometimes say, uh, you know, uh, uh, an, an inch of rain uh, on a very sandy soil may move that wetting front uh, five inches, maybe two to three inches on a clay or clay loam soil, but it doesn't shove all the nitrate ahead of it like like snow with a snow plow. Basically, it tends to dilute the, the nitrate within that range. So, uh, uh, but yes, if we're getting heavy rains on lighter textured soils, we may uh, move some out of the uh, 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 surface there. Uh, a bigger thing I see and have been preaching lately is about all this regrowth or volunteer crop and we've done some measures here, and on some of the, these oat uh, volunteers, uh, we've measured 80 pounds of nitrogen simply in the, the regrowth, uh, the, you know, regrowth that's about you know, 12 inches tall. So uh, not only has this volunteer been sucking valuable water out of the soil, uh, but it's also been uh, transferring nitrogen from an inorganic form that we usually can bank on into a vegetative form, which we have no idea how much of that we're going to get back next year. Some of it is very slow to be released. So if you've got a volunteer crop there uh, or a cover crop sucking nitrogen out of the soil, uh, not only has it been stealing night water from you, but it's been banking nitrogen uh, in a form of uh, unknown availability. Okay, thanks, John. Um... There's a few more questions, but I'm going to save those for uh, next week and uh, we can address them on the Crop Talk next week. But uh, thanks for the great presentation. And uh, we'll uh, go through the uh, few remaining slides here just to uh, finish off for today. But um, just a reminder about the uh, livestock assistance programs that are out there. Um, the uh, Programs are still running and still available, waiting for you to apply if you need them. Uh, the number has been fairly busy with questions, so please, uh, as you're filling things out or looking to fill things out, uh, don't be afraid to call these numbers. Uh, there's a lot of people working at them that are capable of helping you through with the uh, with your uh, with your questions. Uh, the hay listing service again, if you've got hay for sale or looking to buy hay, definitely look at that. We're still doing the crop residue burning, so if you uh, have uh, um, any questions regarding uh, burning, uh, please contact that uh, that uh, address or email address and find out if it's a burning day or not. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, the ag, ag adaptation specialists are still around and available to help you with them, uh, whether it be um, fall fertilizing to fill in out the forms for livestock, as well as the uh, farm production livestock specialists. Uh, they're working with this every day, so definitely uh, look, at, uh, look at them. And- um, hey, hey, Lionel, John here yeah. cutting in. And you're actually uh, hot off the press. Go back right. one picture uh, because uh, uh, Sean and uh, Tim, and uh, Ben Ham are running another ammonification workshop tomorrow afternoon. Right. That's where we've taken hydrous ammonia, inject it into a, a, a covered pile of, of straw or corn stover and increase protein and increase digestibility. So if you're interested in that, talk to either Tim or, or Sean 
and get your way east of the river tomorrow afternoon. Great, thanks, John. I forgot about that. You mentioned it last week and I was gonna put it in, but thanks for reminding me. Uh, your MASC offices, uh, so uh, just a reminder of guys that if you've got crop insurance claims, uh, make sure you get them in. And join us next week, uh, October the 20th, for the next edition of Crop Talk. I'd like to thank our presenters and all the questions that came in. They were great, and uh, we'll deal with some of the other ones uh, next week. Thanks again, guys.